Hello there students, we're starting the third module of this class now in which we're going to actually be creating a model in Octave of the amount of solar, uh, the amount of power that a solar panel could be producing. Um, I guess strictly speaking what we're actually going to be doing is we're going to be creating a model of the amount of solar radiation incident upon the, uh, the solar panel. Um, we're not going to be addressing issues like efficiency of the solar panel or anything like that. Uh, so we're going to be though mostly focusing on like the geometry of the situation, the Earth-Sun geometry, the configuration of the panel, like its tilt and things like that, how to actually write a program to model this, and then how you're going to actually be completing Project 1. This is going to take us a couple of lectures to get through all of this stuff before you're ready to actually start programming, but please don't wait. Project 1 is worth a significant fraction of the total grade in the course, and it is um, a fair amount of work, to be honest. I mean, it's going to take uh, quite a bit of debugging to get it right. So let's spend some time figuring out what's going on. Now, I've labeled this module of the course Solar Flux, just to kind of, I mean, we had to have a name for each module. And I want to be sure we're clear about this term flux, because flux can be a, a tricky idea. Um, meteorologists use the term flux a great deal in um, regards to lots of different quantities. Um, strictly speaking, a flux is some kind of stuff like radiation or energy, or it might be a mass like uh, water, or it might be evaporation or something. It's stuff per unit time, like a certain amount of stuff is happening per unit time, like per second, per unit area. So, like, for example, meteorologists often use the idea of a flux to describe the evaporation rate. A certain number of kilograms of water are evaporating per second off of one square meter of the surface of the Earth. Now, obviously, it's going to be a very small number. There aren't kilograms of water evaporating per second per, cubic me per square meter. But um, this is a concept that atmospheric scientists use a great deal. Here, um, the stuff that we're talking about as being, like, incident upon our solar panel or incident upon a square meter of the surface of the Earth is energy from the sun, joules of energy. And it, our unit time is going to be per second, and our unit area is going to be a square meter. So our, you know, units of our flux, how much stuff, how much energy from the sun per second hits a square meter of our solar panel or a square meter of the surface of the Earth or whatever, is going to have units of joules per second per square meter. And that would be fine, you know, in, in SI scientific units. Um, although, actually, we can kind of simplify this a little bit. I mean, a joule per second is known as a watt. Joules are units of energy. Energy per unit time is a power. So a joule per second is the units of that are watts. And so, actually, we can kind of simplify this a little bit and call this watts per square meter. That would be a fine way to describe this as well. And that tends to be the unit that we use when we're talking about, like, a solar flux, the, the shortwave radiation incident upon the surface of the Earth, or incident upon a solar panel or something like that. We tend to describe it in terms of watts per square meter. So across the, the, the board, across these next, I don't know, five or six lectures, whatever it works out to, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be figuring out the flux of radiation on solar panels. Okay, In particular, the project is going to involve figuring out what is the tilt of these solar panels that would produce the optimal amount of electricity uh, over the course of a year. Although, uh, you know, we could also use the same techniques to figure out, okay, something that's fixed, like these panels that are mounted on this um, orange clay tile roof that you see up there in the top left, um, you know, what, how much power will they be producing? So, in order to do that, though, for this particular lecture of the module, what's our roadmap? What are we doing in this particular lecture? Here we're going to be talking about the output of the sun, in terms of what actually gets to the, surf to the top of the Earth's atmosphere. What makes it cross that 95 million miles between the surface of the sun and the top of the Earth's atmosphere? It's going to have to do with how much power the sun is putting out, of course, and of course, how much that varies from day to day or year to year or whatever, but it's also going to be a function of the Earth-Sun distance. How, uh, the Earth-Sun, the distance between the Earth and the Sun is not the same every day. We are farther from the Sun at one part of the year and we are closer to the Sun at another. So we're going to need to sort all that out so that we can come up with the correct Earth-Sun distance um, and the amount, correct amount of power to reach the top of the Earth's atmosphere, and then you know, then we'll worry about how we transfer that Earth, that radiation through the Earth's atmosphere down to our solar panel, and how we figure out how much power is getting to the solar panel. Well, you know, in, uh, to a good approximation, the the output of the sun that reaches the surface, I'm sorry, the top of the Earth's atmosphere, 
is actually pretty constant. Uh, from one day to the next, the solar output doesn't actually vary all that much. That's why we kind of glibly use the phrase the solar constant. The solar constant, we're going to later use the symbol S0 uh, for the solar constant, uh, is about uh, 1,368 um, 1, uh, watts per square meter. In other words, this is uh, uh, the amount of radiation here, I'll give you the actual definition from the American Meteorological Society's Glossary of Meteorology. The solar constant is the amount of solar radiation received at the outside of the Earth's atmosphere at a surface normal to the incident radiation. In other words, we're not yet worrying about, like, you know, the curvature of the Earth and the tilt of, uh, you know, the solar declination and the sun angles and stuff. We're just saying, if you have, at Earth's dist mean distance from the sun, if you have like one square meter facing directly towards the sun, how many joules per second are incident upon that square meter, or how many watts per square meter uh, is the solar flux at that at the mean distance between the Earth and the sun? Now, this solar constant does vary. The word solar constant is in fact a well-known misuse of the word constant. It does vary for a number of different reasons. I mean, for example, there was the sunspot spike cycle. Okay, sunspots are places on the sun that are a little bit cooler than the spaces around them. Uh, since the wavelength of radiation which an object gives off is a function by Wien's law of the temperature of the object, then places that are cooler are giving off radiation at a slightly different wavelength. It happens that the wavelengths shift out of the uh, short waves that we see with our eyes into slightly longer wavelengths that we can't see, so to our eyes they look dark. But they also are, because those sunspots are a little bit cooler, they are giving off less radiation. And so the, when the sun has sunspots on it, uh, which it has all the time, but sometimes there's more and sometimes there's less, that does influence the total amount of radiation that the sun gives off. Um, but it doesn't change it all that much. I mean, t uh, typical sunspot uh, you know, variability from day to day as to how much the sun is giving off, it ranges on the order of like 0.1%. Okay. Now, there is a sunspot cycle that we do also need to think about. See, about every 11 years, we go through a complete cycle of there being lots of sunspots and times where there are virtually none, uh, a, a process that is actually not very well understood at all in terms of the aronomy. Aronomy is the study of the sun-earth-space environment. Uh, they, you know, why there's a, a roughly 11-year cycle. Uh, there's also long-term variability. If you look at that little graph down there in the bottom right, you can see like the Maunder minimum, a period in like the 16 and 1700s where there are basically no spot sunspots. Um, obviously, then there is some variability in the solar output that is just due to sunspots. But this is relatively small. Uh, when we're trying to simulate how much power our uh, panel is going to uh, be generating, Honestly, the, we're, the, the errors in other terms are bigger than this, okay? We don't need to take into account sunspots because we're going to make bigger errors than the amount of radiation being variable by 0.1%, uh, you know, in terms of, like, how much cloud cover there is and stuff like that, okay? This term we can kind of not worry about. Um, there are other long-term changes to, like, the Earth-Sun geometry that is changing how much uh, energy we're getting from the sun, uh, the one that you're probably most aware exists, you may not know the name, is the Milankovitch cycles. The Milankovitch cycles are important changes in terms of how the Earth orbits the Sun. Um, overall, the mean distance of the Earth from the Sun doesn't really change. But the Milankovitch cycles are a natural source of climate variability. Uh, and, well, by, when I say climate variability here, I mean in terms of how much radiation we're receiving from the sun, because the Earth's orbit is, on very long periods of time, slightly chaotic. It is slightly perturbed by the uh, orbits and the gravity of, of other planets, especially Jupiter. And so there are um, long-term changes in, like, for example, the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. Uh, we'll see this term in just, again, a little bit, but eccentricity is, like, how round is the Earth's orbit how, versus how oval it is. Uh, sometimes the Earth's orbit is closer to being circular, and we get about the same amount of radiation from the sun every day, versus uh, over long periods of time, Earth's orbit can change a little bit. The mean distance between the Earth and the Sun doesn't change, but we'll have periods of where we are closer and periods where we are farther. Uh, there's also the obliquity. The obliquity is the tilt of the Earth's axis. 
Uh, that also can be perturbed by a number of factors involving interaction with the gravity of the moon and with the gravity of the other planets and so on. The tilt of the Earth's axis is going to have a lot to do with things like solar declination and sun angles and so on. So we need to know about how much the Earth's axis is tilted and we also need to know about the precession of the Earth's axis. Um, we need to know which way it's pointing on any given uh, day, and that actually can change over geologic time. But here's the deal. All of these Milankovitch cycles are very, very well understood. Okay? Um, this is just math and physics and stuff. It can be done. But all of those kind of cycles have periods on the order of like 21,000 to 40,000 years. Okay? They are good ways of explaining things like long-term climate change. Why was the planet colder and we had an ice age 40,000 years ago, and we don't have um, ice on our planet. Well, we don't have, we're not in an ice age like that right now. Um, Milankovitch cycles are a big part of that kind of explanation. Uh, but they are not going to be a very good way of explaining things like how much solar power are you going to get. Oh my goodness, our solar panels will be generating more power um, because of changes in the obliquity of the, uh, the, of the Earth's axis uh, 10,000 years from now. Are you really planning on those solar panels being there for 10,000 years? I don't think so. So, I mean, in general, these kind of changes are things you'll find in textbooks, but aren't necessarily applicable to the kind of challenges that we faced in a class like this. On the other hand, like if you're an ATS 564 student where you're doing statistical meteorology and maybe you're trying to study paleoclimate, what was the climate like on the Earth at some distant time in the past, then you would, you would need to take into account changes like, you know, the amount of radiation reaching the surface of the Earth due to changes, you know, in the Earth's orbit from Milankovitch cycles. Now, the radiation from the sun is going to be traveling from the surface of the sun to the top of the Earth's atmosphere. And that's how much we get, what is the power reaching, the, what is the flux of solar radiation reaching the top of the Earth's atmosphere, is of course very critically dependent on the distance the Earth is from the sun. Um, obviously the farther the Earth is, the less radiation we're receiving per square meter, and the closer the Earth is to the Sun, the more we're receiving per square meter. And the amount that we are receiving from the Sun is going to be dependent on an inverse square law. An inverse square law is one of these kinds of laws where the amount that you are receiving is proportional to that little alpha symbol there means a proportional. The amount of radiation that you're receiving, the flux of radiation you're receiving is proportional to 1 over the distance squared. So, for example, the, you know, if you are twice as far away from an object that is giving ra off radiation, you receive four times less radiation. Because you have gone twice as far, the flux of radiation by the inverse square law will be one for, uh, you'll receive four times less radiation. And so, well, okay, I mean, the Earth's orbit changes, so therefore there are apparently, because there are annual variations in the Earth-Sun distance, we're going to have area, annual variations in terms of how much radiation we're receiving, because I mean, the Earth's orbit is an ellipse. Uh, we are closest to the Earth on a date that is called perihelion. Perihelion falls roughly January 3rd, January 4th. It depends uh, a little bit on things like leap year and stuff like that. Uh, we are closest to the Sun on that day, and we are farthest from the Sun on uh, right around July 3rd and January 4th, uh, July 4th rather, on a day called aphelion. Uh, aphelion is the day that we are farthest from the Sun. And the question is, how big is the difference? I mean, we actually need some kind of equation that's going to be telling us how far, what is the Earth-Sun distance on any given day? Well, it turns out that's actually a fairly straightforward thing that, like, orbital mechanics gives us. I mean, a, a physics class can derive this equation and so on. Where that Earth-Sun distance is going to be given by the symbol big D. We're going to, of course, find that the big, that distance is a function of time, right? We need to know what day we're on, but right now we're just saying D is equal to, all right, now, A a here is one astronomical unit, the mean distance between the Earth and the Sun, and I've given you the value there. It's about 1.5 times 10 to the 11th power meters. Um, but it is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. And that little E that's in there, that is not Euler's E, like as in, uh, you know, for uh, computing, uh, you know, logs and things like that. That is the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. Now, the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit does change on geologic time due to Milankovitch cycles, but the present value is more than enough for what you're doing in this class. So the current value of the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit is there. Again, this is a measure of how far the Earth's orbit is from being a perfect circle, how elliptical the Earth's orbit is. And then there's this little new, that thing in there that looks like a V. That is the true anomaly. True anomaly is a term that comes to us from astronomy. 
true anomaly is a way of describing where in the Earth's orbit we are. Where we just, if you could like picture it here, a, a diagram where I've got the sun sitting at a focus of the ellipse that is the Earth's orbit. If you took perihelion, the day in which we are closest to the sun, and we're just going to say, okay, we're at some different location than perihelion now. What is that angle between where we are now and where we were when we were at perihelion? So you see how you like kind of make a little angle there between the Earth at perihelion, the sun, and the Earth where we are now? That angle is called the true anomaly. And um, here's the deal about that true anomaly. It is a really difficult bit of math to compute, okay? It is not really necessary, though, to compute it because it turns out there's another term that comes to us from an astronomy class called mean anomaly. Mean anomaly is M, and big M is just, and then here's some symbols here, and, well, the math doesn't look bad there, right? I mean, it's just a multiplication and a division and a subtraction. I can live with that. And most of those values there are, are pretty straightforward and constant. I mean, C is just two pi radians or 360 degrees, depending on whether you're working in radians or in degrees. Um, that T is going to be the Julian day of the year, you know, counting from 1 being uh, January 1st, just counting forward to what is your current day of the year. And Tau is the Julian day associated with perihelion, which is we'll use January 3rd. It's close enough for our purposes here. And then P will be just the period of the Earth's orbit. How long is it an orbit of the Earth? And it's 365.25 days. All right, well, this, this doesn't look so bad. That's just algebra. You were, I mean, that's not even really algebra. It's kind of arithmetic. You were good at that kind of stuff in junior high. All right, so now that we have a way of computing this Earth-Sun distance, D, we have this equation, but you know what? We can get rid of that business of true anomaly, new, and replace it with mean anomaly, M, and they're accurate enough. We don't need to get stressed about the difference. And we can go ahead and remember, though, that that mean anomaly is actually a function of T, the day, Julian day of the year that you're on. So, you know, we've got to remember that that Earth-Sun distance, then, is a function of the day that you're on, too. So see how I made D is a function of T? And then notice on the, on the uh, right-hand side of the equation, uh, the, the mean anomaly is what is a function of D there, a T, rather, there. All right. I see, and notice I changed it from equal sign to squigglies, you know, the little almost equal to symbol. Okay, great. And so, let's do the math. If we're trying to figure out the difference between how much radiation we're receiving at perihelion and how much radiation we're receiving at aphelion, okay, let's work it out. Let's find out what is the Earth-Sun distance, D, on perihelion. All right, well, if you plug in the numbers there, on perihelion, the mean anomaly is zero and the cosine of zero, remember, yeah, you can go back and review those slides as to why the mean anomaly would be zero on uh, perihelion. Uh, the cosine of zero is one, you do the math, and you end up with on perihelion, you have a distance of about 1.47 times 10 to the 11th meters. That is the distance between the Earth and the Sun on the day that the Earth is closest to the Sun. And we could do the same sort of thing on the aphelion, the day when the Earth is farthest from the Sun. I mean, on this day, the mean anomaly turns out to be equivalent to pi, Okay, again, you can go back and look at the slide about mean anomaly to see why it would be pi. And then cosine of pi is negative 1. You plug that in there, and you're going to get that on aphelion, the distance between the Earth and the Sun is about 1.52 times 10 to the 11th power meters. Okay, so we had those two different numbers. We had a distance between the Earth and the Sun on perihelion when the Earth was closest, and the distance between the Earth and the Sun on aphelion when the Sun was farthest. And the distance between those two works out to about 5 times 10 to the 9th power meters. That's, you know, that's a whole lot of kilometers. That's, that's about 5 million kilometers, isn't it? That seems like a lot. Okay, now keep in mind, the flux of the radiation is not just the distance, it's proportional to 1 over the distance squared. Right, I mean, so as we get farther, it's not just that it's the distance, it's the distance squared that matters. So we can actually work this through. On, we're not going to figure out the actual flux of radiation on that day, we're just going to figure out what it's proportional to. Okay, on perihelion, that flux would then be proportional by the inverse square law. It's proportional to a number 4.6 times 10 to the negative 23rd power. Okay, there's going to be other terms. I mean, this, this doesn't have units of like watts per square meter or something like that. It's just a number. Okay, our answer is going to be proportional to this. And um, on aphelion, the, uh, the flux is going to be proportional to, again, you do run the same numbers there, 1 over d squared. You get 4.33 times 10 to the negative 23rd power. The, the answer is proportional to those two numbers. And in fact, so the difference can be shown to be about 6.5%.
There is about 6.5% more radiation reaching the top of the Earth's atmosphere on perihelion, when we're closest to the, Earth, to the, to the Sun, rather, than on aphelion, when we are farthest from the Sun. Okay, then I had a tough question. Does 6% matter? Is 6% a big enough difference between uh, uh, the amount of radiation we're receiving on perihelion and the amount we're receiving on aphelion that we should be caring about it? Um, well, it kind of depends on the application and how hard you're willing to work to get these calculations exactly right versus you're willing to say that's within the error bars of my calculation. I mean, um, you know, like I've got some panels here from a forecast, okay? This was a computer simulation of the weather on different days. And um, does a computer model like this actually keep track of, like, what the actual flux at the top of the Earth's atmosphere is? What is the solar constant in each of these days? Yeah, I mean, this calculation of the Earth-Sun distance and making the necessary adjustments to the solar constant to reflect the fact that we are slightly farther from the Earth, from the Sun on certain days and slightly closer to the Sun on other days, that's not that big of a calculation. Uh, it's not that big of a deal on something like on model. I mean, these computer models that make these forecasts run for hours uh, on a supercomputer, the tiny little calculation that I just walked you through is not that burdensome. We might as well do it. Okay, um, on the other hand, like for example, for a solar panel, if you're trying to uh, make a determination about like the positioning of a solar panel, does it really make sense to worry about this? I would probably argue no. Um, I mean, if you're trying to estimate how much power the solar panel is going to be producing, there's a lot of other factors that are going to introduce errors into that, like the cloud cover or air quality or things like that. Well, I mean, you're not going to be within 6% of estimations of the, how much cloud cover there is. So honestly, this is a, this error. This term is probably smaller than the error anyway. Uh, that's already in the equation. You can probably do a scale analysis here and figure out that you could you could probably not worry about this term. We are worrying about this term in our particular project, but we wouldn't necessarily have to. Um, I guess if you were doing solar power available to something like the International Space Station, you might want to worry about this. In part because, of course, the space station is above the clouds. Okay, there is no atmosphere attenuating the radiation that is arriving from the sun. Whatever reaches the Earth's orbit from the sun is what's hitting the solar panels of the International Space Station. <coughs> Excuse me. So honestly, I probably would say it's worth the work because also because keep in mind these solar panels are actually you know part of life support equipment <laughs> right for the International Space Station in contrast to like a demonstration technology at Creighton's parking lot, faculty parking lot or something like that right. Okay, so it kind of depends on the application as to whether or not, you know, this Earth-Sun distance type calculation would be necessary so that you would get a really good estimate of the solar flux at the top of the Earth's atmosphere versus just saying, you know what, I'm going to throw out that number uh, that is the flux, the, the value, the, the accepted value of the um, solar flux, which is 1,368 watts per square meter. All right, before I move on to the next video here, I want to ask you a couple questions. Uh, so our first question is, what are the units of, the fl of a flux of solar radiation? And I'm going to tell you that I give you four choices here. A, watts per square meter, B, watts, C, joules per second per square meter, and uh, D, newtons per square meter. So look over those choices, and then from the um, options below here, choose one of the four alternatives to move on to the next video. And find out if you got, I'm sorry, to, to move on and get some feedback about your answer before you move on to the next question.